Uh, good morning. Today is Friday, June 12th. It's 10 o'clock. This is a meeting of the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. Um, and we are uh, working today on um, Act 250 and uh, considerations that we are going to be placing into an amendment that will then be added to the housing bill S-237. The goal for today's meeting is to work through um, all the uh, open items that we have and uh, you know, sort of straw poll our way along, yeses and nos to what goes into a final draft. We won't have a final draft, vo votable draft today. But I've talked to the Ledge Council, and they've agreed uh, kindly to work with the uh, with the committee over the weekend to have such a clean draft prepared. And we will reconvene on Monday. Thank you to committee members for agreeing to meet on a Monday to go through that final draft and have a vote. Um, we will we'll convene at nine on Monday. Um, so any committee questions uh, in terms of our plan of action here for today and Monday? Okay, well, great. Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to ask uh, our counsel, Ms. Tchaikovsky, to um, uh, walk us through uh, the current first cut at an amendment to 237. It captures a fair amount of the things we've talked about this week but there are more things to um, either add, remove, or edit. So, Ms. Tchaikovsky, are you ready to do that? Take command of the screen. <laughs> sure. Okay. So, hello, I have uh, sent Jude this document to be posted on your committee page. It is, as Senator Bray just said, a, a, a document containing what I think are currently all the pieces that have been under discussion for a possible amendment to, uh, to S-237. Uh, this document is not organized officially as an amendment because uh, there are still a lot of decisions that need to be made, but I tried to organize them by topic so that they would be easy to read. Um, and is it, all right, it is posted on your website under proposed amendments. So uh, we, I do just want to check, we have sort of a limited amount of time today. We Senator Bray, is there anything you want me to start with particularly or just go as I have it organized? Uh, let's just go right on through and um, committee members, if you see something of concern, et cetera, um, you know, let's, let's basically, my, uh, I'm always saying, let's paint our, paint our way out of the room. Um, so as we see things, if people are fine with it, we'll check in and then that's a check mark. Uh, it, at least for the next draft, that 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 language is good, and we're going to keep that. So, and let's just start taking a tour. Okay, so the first topic is uh, municipal planning, and so one of the things that we uh, have talked about. Yesterday's witnesses um, talked a lot about the provisions that are in S-237 related to municipal planning under Title 24. So in conversations uh, with the chair after the hearing yesterday, um, this amendment is going to propose to strike out the new subdivision B, which is the inclusive development provisions, and um, the associated sections of the bill, so section three and section four, and then section 26. And in its place, um, I haven't drafted it yet, but it would be a, a sort of study um, slash report back on recommendations from the department on a proposal that would increase housing density in municipalities while still preserving the ability of the municipality to have diverse solutions. So. Uh, it sounded like the committee was interested in avoiding the, the cookie cutter mandates that S-237 has currently. And so this is um, my attempt to uh, address those concerns. Okay. 
we haven't talked about this specific model in committee yet, but this is so. I, you know, I think Senator Parent brought it up the, and his um, town planner, uh, Mr. Sawyer, about naming, you know, a density, for instance, naming a density target, a performance target, and then allowing municipalities to figure their own best way to achieve those kinds of targets. Um, so the thought I had based on that discussion was just what Mr. Kowski said, go to a study, bring it back uh, at the beginning of the session and uh, equip ourselves to write a, a more flexible way of responding to planning. You know, I, I think back to our own committee's history of doing things by naming performance targets and then letting uh, different groups figure their own way forward. We've done that in municipal planning, regional planning, statewide energy planning. So it would seem consistent with that approach. Um, the other thing is I would hope that we could, we might be able to knit that into the uh, zoning for great neighborhoods discussion that's going on so that we're not creating parallel processes, but that we end up pulling things together. Uh, and given that we're talking about a three-year cycle of replanning, um, having a report at the beginning of next year, my hope is that we would lose very little time uh, in terms of making progress, but have the benefit at the beginning of the next biennium of having that information. So, Senator Parent, uh, I think it was, you had said something along those lines, and Mr. Sawyer, any comment on that one? Okay, so let's keep going then, please. So, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, Senator McDonald. Yeah, this, this would also, um, yesterday there was a concern that the changes in zoning might upset the, the existing um, attempt to meld high income and low income housing in communities and that they didn't want to throw that out. Is this amendment going to restore that, that can um, allay that concern? Well, I think that's something we're going to come back to later in this discussion. We are, okay, we, then. We're being okay. joined um, yep. okay. by Mr. Aminen from NRB uh, and others to address some um, fairly technical considerations about how we, how we define, refer to, and wire quote unquote, affordability into planning statute. Okay. Thank you. But thanks for flagging it because it's definitely in play. Yes. Okay. okay, so um, so I am going to draft up study committee language for that to add um, there. Um, the next uh, the next provision is the the wastewater um, permit uh, amendments that you heard about yesterday from uh, Mike O'Grady. So this is his language that he discussed yesterday. Great. Um, any committee questions on that? I, I think we are all set on those revisions. Uh, uh, and ANR also supported them. So, okay. Great, so good to go on the wastewater potable water. Yep, okay. The next section is, all right, so then we get into the Act 250 changes. So uh, S-237 does contain an exemption for designated downtown and neighborhood development areas. Part of that proposal is that existing permits in those areas are automatically extinguished. So this proposal is also something we have only talked about briefly, but not um, seen language on yet. So uh, we've had discussion about whether or not the permit should be extinguished automatically. Uh, in conversations with the chair, we discussed that um, H-926 had, a, had an additional proposal that was related. So I tried to adapt the language and this relates to some of the comments Alex Weinhagen had yesterday about whether the district commission should be in charge of um, addressing the whether the permit conditions in the Act 250 permit should be added to the municipal permit. So um, I have added a proposal here that you haven't seen this language yet, but it, it's a change in jurisdictional use to release a jurisdiction over a permit. So 
Uh, the downtowns and neighborhood development areas are going to be exempt. So new projects in there will not have to go through the Act 250 process, but there are um, existing permits in those areas. Um, under this new language um, that I've added, uh, those permits will be able to apply to have their, uh, be released from their permits they will apply to the district commissions and the district commission will evaluate if the permit conditions are still relevant and necessary um, to mitigate um, impacts under the Act 250 criteria. And the district commission has the option to approve or deny releasing the permit from jurisdiction. So uh, that brought out of the discussion and uh, around the notion of uh, it's fine to sort of facilitate development by releasing an Act 250 uh, condition that was in the original permit, if you're going to extinguish that permit or the requirement to have such a permit. But the, um, the sort of neutral party that reflected all the interested parties at the time the conditioning took place is the, the Act 250 uh, panel. And the, um, it was just, they don't have a vested interest in extinguishing. They have an interest in seeing that the, the balance that the conditions attempted to achieve are in perpetuity are the remain in place. If uh, uh, a municipality believes that something ought to be waived or a developer sh should be waived or extinguished, then fine. But let's not have, otherwise I think we place municipalities in a unusual position of, of removing conditions at another planning panel in place. Um, and they may have very different motives. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Frey, I'd, I'd like to ask whoever's not yeah. muted, if they could please mute because we continue to get background noise. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Campion. So um, the other thing too, I, well, so let's uh, look at the language together. Um, the, as part of that discussion, I wanted to make sure that a municipality would always have the ability to participate in such a hearing so that we would make for ready access back to the Act 250 uh, uh, panel in order to request such a removal of such a condition, for instance. Um, okay, yeah, and we'll, uh, I wrote this um, quickly, so it might need work. Um, so on a signed application, on an application signed by each permittee, the district commission may release land subject to a permit under this chapter from the obligations of that permit and the obligation to obtain amendments to the permit on finding each of the following. First, one of the following is true. Um, and so this is language that was in 926, so it may not be relevant for your purposes, so we can discuss that. The use of the land as of the date of the application is not the same as the use of the land that caused the obligation to obtain a permit under this chapter, so there has been a change in use, or the municipality where the land is located has adopted permanent zoning and subdivision bylaws, but had not when the permit was issued, or the land is located in a designated downtown or neighborhood development area that, ex that is exempt from this chapter. The use of the land as of the date of the application does not constitute development or subdivision as defined in section 6001 of this title and would not require a permit or permit amendment, but for the fact that the land is already subject to a permit under this chapter. The permittee or permittees are in compliance with the permit and their obligations under this chapter. <clears throat> what, what's, the chapter? what's the chapter we're talking about? We're in Act 250, so we're in Chapter 151. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Under Act 250, that's what it means. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. It shall be a condition of each affirmative decision under this subsection that a subsequent proposal of a development or subdivision on the land to which the decision applies shall be subject to the 
this chapter as if the land had never previously received a permit under this chapter. Um, that language might not need to be in there, actually, if you decide to pursue this proposal. Um, an application for a decision under this subsection shall be made on a form prescribed by the board. The form shall require evidence demonstrating the applicant complies with subdivisions 1A through C of this subsection. The application shall be processed in a manner described under the uh, section of Act 250 governing hearings and may be treated as a minor application under that section. In determining whether to treat as a minor application under the section, the district commission shall comply with the criteria of the subsection and not the subsection um, 6086A of this title. So it gives the commission the option to either treat it as a minor application um, with, with no hearing or as a major application, which would be a hearing process with um, parties. Does it have also have the option of saying that Act 250 just flat out no longer applies because um, for, I may, may I give you an example, Mr. Chair? Yes, please. So, um, I've got a small town has two, two issues. One, it had a former private school that did some, um, some stuff on its campus, um, but it covered uh, you know, um, scores of acres. And um, the school's gone defunct, the campus isn't there, the land is owned by different people um, in blocks of you know, five acres, 10 acres, 20 acres. And when they go to do something, they find out their, their land is under Act 250, but there are no records of the, in town of, of the decisions. They can't find the records of what used to exist in the 80s. Um, and same with a municipal building that was uh, purchased from a private enterprise on a large tract of land all of which is now subject to Act 250. There are no records at um, the district commission and no records in the town. It's no longer a commercial activity and um, they have to go through Act 250 whenever they wanna do something on that ordinarily wouldn't be, wouldn't be necessary. Does it include those? Um, it does include those, although I guess I'm a little confused how um how if there's no records how do you know that there's a permit because it in the it the record says it the land is subject to act 250 review but but that's is in the deed somewhere so every time anybody wants to do something or you know put a culvert under their driveway they have to you know, um, the, 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 this has been an ongoing problem in this a very small town that was very informal back in the in the eight, early 80s, mid 80s. Yes, so the House Committee did spend time on that issue and that's what this provision was related to originally. Um, Thank you, I should have just asked, is the provision in the House bill which deals with this still in there? Thank you very much. Yeah, so, so, we, have, yeah, so we haven't fully talked about this um, topic in this committee and so in trying to address the chair's concern, I thought it would make sense and it maybe needs a little more tightening up but I did also add this paragraph at the end. The district commission shall evaluate the conditions in the permit and determine whether the conditions are still necessary to mitigate impacts under the criteria in section 6086A. If the district commission finds that the conditions are necessary, it shall deny the application or approve the application on the condition that the necessary conditions are added to the municipal permit. So, so this, this applies to from one end of the town to the other, not just to the downtowns. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's, you know, the concept here is extinguishment with some review on yes. why the, the extinguishment would be allowed. So, okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so um, I then added in here that um, currently, sec, uh, S-237 has a, an amendment for the definition of mixed use under Act 250, and um, you have received a proposal from Evan from the Natural Resources Board, and you're going to hear about it, so I didn't know if you wanted to include his specific recommendation um, or or keep what's in S-237. So I wanted to flag that as something we should discuss. 
Um, why, don't we, why don't we briefly go through it and then we'll, that will make people somewhat familiar with it. And then we'll, we'll dive into it in the, the last half hour of our meeting this morning in more detail, but maybe you can just. Can, can we, level. can we not? Can we not? Sure. Now, I see that we have quite a bit more, so let's pass yes. over and do it all at once. Okay. And that, frankly, to me, is more of a legalities of um, housing. It's more of a, a and technical, yeah. And our focus is, so I think that the, the, the issues coming up is important that it gets flagged. I don't know that we're the right committee to, to sort out legal definitions around affordability and et cetera in terms of pure housing, but I think it would be a disservice if we see the conflicting memos and don't bring the issue and get it on the table, so. Okay, so then um, criterion 1D under Act 250, uh, we discussed that this is a fairly non-controversial, um, maybe even a considered a technical change. Um, this is in H926, so this is changing the definition of floodway to flood hazard area and floodway fringe to river corridor, and then updating those definitions, uh, and then updating their use in Criterion 1D, uh, and so this matches ANR's um, recent developments in this area. Okay. Thank you. Any committee questions on that one? All right. Onward. Um, so then we have recreational trails, um, and we discussed the language around the recreational trail amendment recently. I did work with the stakeholders to, um, come up with some new language. And again, I don't know if you want to discuss this, um, the changes I made right now or if you want to me to continue with the other pieces of the amendment or if you want me to show you what we discussed let's let's see what we discussed on this one okay so i worked with the stakeholders on updating the language um to make sure it better conformed to some of the existing definitions in act 250. <clears throat> so the changes are in yellow um, we I did also um, hear some feedback from the Natural Resources Board, and so some of the changes, the changes are all from that process that we we um, discussed in the last few days. So, um, slight change to the definition of trail. So, trail may be used for recreation, transportation, or other compatible purposes, but the primary purpose shall not be the operation of a motor vehicle. As used in this subsection, motor vehicles shall not include all-terrain vehicles or snowmobiles. And uh, this Can is- I pause and ask, I don't remember the phrase, I don't remember any discussion around purpose, uh, as a primary purpose versus other purpose. So the concern here is because if you're adding the road rule, uh -huh. um, we wanna make sure we distinguish something that is a trail from a road. Okay. Um, then we have the definition of recreational trail that will be added to Act 250. So it matches that definition I just mentioned. And then we add the definition of Vermont Trail System Trail to Act 250 also. Um, I added the word county just so that it matches the phrasing that is used in Act 250 already. And then we have the, the jurisdictional trigger for Vermont Trail System Trails. So you recall as our, in our discussion, Vermont Trails, the Vermont Trail System is established in Chapter 20 of Title 10, and it um, gives the agency, uh, the Department of Forest, Parks, and Recreation, the ability to recognize trails as part of the Vermont Trails System. So development is defined to include the construction of improvements for a Vermont Trail System trail on a tract or tracts of land involving more than 10 acres. 
This subdivision shall be the exclusive mechanism for determining jurisdiction over a recreational trail that is or is proposed to be a Vermont trail system trail and shall only apply to the construction of improvements made on or after July 1, 2020. So um, maybe you're going to get to this. Uh, the, the question I have when I hear that, read that, is the or is proposed to be, because we talked about this in committee the other day. What if someone, I don't, not anticipating this, but we always try to guard against something being gamed. So merely making, how does one demonstrate uh, that a trail is proposed to be part of the Vermont state trail system in order to gain this, this special status for being reviewed. So, so I will say that I, I worked on this language. I attempted to make it a lot more clear than the prior draft. And I think that it is more clear and easy to read, but in my redrafting, I, struggle with that same point. And I actually, I think that this language, I, I think it is not advisable to add this recreational trail amendment. And the reason is largely due to what Senator Bray just asked about. So there is a problem in administering this, this sort of section technically, because typically, uh, typically, or it, the, pro the process plays out that a trail is recognized as part of the trail system after it has been completed. However, Act 250, an Act 250 permit needs to be received before construction begins. So you do have a problem of evidence about whether or not someone is going to be able to prove that they are part of the Vermont trail system. Um, I think that there is a difficulty because I don't think there is currently as part of the process for the Vermont trail system, I don't think there's a pre-approval that is given. Um, and I think that there have been recent examples of this happening where there have been potential, there, there may have been some instances recently where someone applied to be a trail and did not receive recognition from the Vermont trail system. So um, while this is a, while this section largely restates existing law, um, that Vermont trail system trails are for a public purpose, um, having it as a jurisdictional trigger creates this, this sort of odd um, logic problem because they can't be determined to fall under this jurisdictional trigger if they aren't actually in existence and we don't know if they're going to get their recognition. Okay. Is the test for recognition into being accepted as a Vermont trail system trail um, include having received all necessary permits? Um, I'm not certain. I was having trouble finding the specific criteria um, for becoming a Vermont trail system trail. It's not in statute. Um, it's uh, a criteria established by um, the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. So I, I don't know specifically. Okay, so let's find that as a question. I mean, it is very, whatever, challenging construct that evidence to be admitted into the trail system is, as I understand it, having all the necessary permits, but we're excluding someone from getting an Act 50 permit. And if that's one of the major criteria for acceptance, then I don't know what level, I don't know what the analysis will be for what happens during this time period that we have for laying out here. So. Mr. Chair. Senator McDonald. Just, I, I keep asking myself, is this, an attempt, uh, I, and I say a, a good faith attempt to, to sort of say recreational trails shall be regulated outside of Act 250 by a non-Act 250 entity that 
incorporates um, a host of requirements specific, germane, and um, and worthy of trail management. Is that what we're trying to get to? I would say yes. And what's happening now that's making this tricky is that rather than saying, here is the way we would do exactly what you just said, we're going to figure out how to do what you just said. And in the meantime, we want to use an alternative, which is this language that would let people move forward now um, until that language and program is developed, presented, codified, et cetera. So if we, if we uh, were we to move in that direction, where does the decision-making for, and if, I'm, if we move in that direction, I think that might be work well. We, if you had the, 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 the establish the administrative body that would that would um, regulate this, but would be separate from Act Two Hundred and Fifty. Um, how are decisions made between trails that uh, are cross country skiing and walking, and on the other end have various degrees of motors, um, and and vie for the same to use of the same trail? Where are those? Would those decisions? be made um, and how does this transition period right. alter or not alter how did those decisions are made today uh, i think that's a great question I, I i you know i don't know how it would play out under this proposal this i mean what we're talking about is transition provisions because these are sunsetted um is it 2021 it's, it's 18 months, so January 2022. So it, this may not be the right time to ask this question, and I'll be glad to listen later, but if there is a trail that allows some um, you know, footpaths and uh, cross-country skiing, maybe snowmobiles, maybe not, um, and during this 18-month period, who makes a decision of, well, we're, this is going to be open to ATVs or um, you know, motorbikes or, or pedal bicycles, something that was not, the trail was not, had not yet been open to. How would those, how would those decisions be made during the 18 months? So we're not creating a full exemption from Act 250, um, but we're changing, we're, what we're sort of doing is, um, if something is proposed to be part of the Vermont trail system, they use the involved ca land calculation of physically altering land, which is a higher threshold. More land is going to be required to trigger Act 250. Well, well we're, also trying to, we're also trying to understand, I think I tried to use the expression yesterday, we all know what a spaghetti lot is, but a, a trail is pretty much an a angel here um, a lot. It's very, it, it takes many, many miles to add up to something that's reviewable. Um, we're, we're trying to deal with that in this bill and hopefully in wherever we get to at the end of 18 months. So during the 18 months of in between, what will the standards be? Uh, they would be the other existing standards. Um, and it really is fact dependent on what the trail is going to require. If it's going to require any construction or any other potential permits like a wetlands permit or a municipal permit. Um, so we're not changing any of that. Um, so perhaps, perhaps the commissioner of forests and parks is ahead of us in knowing where this might be going and might be able to help be helpful on that. And I'm, but I don't, I don't know. Right. I'm well, the trying to get that answer and I will be quiet and listen to those who. Yeah. So the commissioners are on the call, uh, whatever, on the meeting. So commissioner, good morning. Could you address Senator McDonald's question? And then when you're done with that one, double back to what is the test for admission into the Vermont trails system uh, for any applicant. 
Sure, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to, for the record, Michael Snyder, Commissioner of Forest Parks and Recreation. I, I think I'll start with the last piece. Uh, the, the criteria we use would be, includes, um, uh, the, as you indicated, having your necessary permits in place, which typically in, uh, would, would involve more of the ANR DEC type permits, storm water, et cetera, wetlands, uh, that the, the trail would be open to the public that they meet certain environmental standards for trail uh, construction, use, and maintenance. Uh, that's sort of beyond the normal permitting, but is in the realm of best practices for recreational trails. Uh, all of which is intended to uh, really to get at the key piece here, which is that it's to ascertain that it's for a public purpose meeting certain thresholds. We use the Vermont Trails and Greenways Council, which exists in the statute to provide advice in this uh, to us as we make the determination. So it's permits open to the public, a non-commercial, I, I failed to mention that, uh, a suite of environmental considerations that we make um, beyond the environmental permits that were local permits that might be necessary. Uh, and to kind of basically ascertain again that this is of a relatively high standard and that it is for a public purpose. Um, so that, that's the, and we use the Trails and Greenways Council for, uh, for advice and consent on this. And uh, so it, with that, I hope that's helpful, but I could use a little help. I'd love to help with Senator McDonald's question. Could it be reframed and just as a direct question so I can try to address it? Yes. Um, almost most people would say, look at the uh, former railroad bed right away and say, wow, what a great place for uh, ATVs to travel on snowmobiles in the wintertime and they might look at the hike, the hike from Smuggler's Notch to the top of Mount Mansfield and say, yeah, that should be for people only and maybe a dog can go with you. How do, would the commission, the, how would the decisions on trails be made between those two extremes during the 18 month period and thereafter? Um, uh, if, if I, th I guess I, what I would say is that with the way we do it now, so we have within the Vermont trail system, there's a, quite a variety of trail types and user groups that span from, as you indicate, sort of traditional hiking trails, but includes thousands of miles, frankly, of snow machine trails in the vast system, the Vermont mm -hmm. association, of snow travelers, yeah. uh, in the VTS. Similarly, we have different standards and different approaches for those that are uh, the many, many local chapters of the Vermont Mountain Bike Association that are within the trail system. And so this spans both public lands and private lands. And the idea here is to extend the uh, different treatment for trails of a public purpose, like those on state lands or municipal lands, to these private lands that meet that public purpose test. Uh, and so, it, and, and with, with appropriately differing um, criteria for the different trail types, just recognizing, as you say, that, that a, a single track mountain bike trail is inappropriate for an ATV, but other trails, uh, other places would be appropriate. And so we want to make, for whatever the use is, we want to make sure that they have the appropriate design uh, and maintenance and use standards in place. And, and that's the process we go through. I hope that helps. Uh, it, it helps. I'm, I'm, I'm helped in understanding the breadth of, of possibilities here. And I, I don't know how they would be, be, I don't want to use the word reined in, but maybe, or, um, you picking and choosing, um, on what the uses might be. So, okay. um, yeah. can I double back, uh, commissioner Snyder? So the, the can you just I, I don't know what the numbers are can you just ballpark what percentage of vermont trail system trails developed or re accepted into the program in the last something of whatever 10 years have an act 250 permit boy I like to, common. I my i think so potentially jamie or warren i believe are probably on the call could could uh, back me on this. I, my understanding is it's relatively uncommon um, for these these nature this type of recreational trail systems that are purely recreational trail systems and not associated with other development. So, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, people. But I, my take is it's relatively uncommon. Uh, Senator Bray, would you repeat your question? My question was: What percentage of trails added to the Vermont trail system in the last decade include an Act 250? permit thank you i don't know how often jurisdiction uh, that permit becomes part of the um criteria for acceptance or or not into a system well so commissioner do you have any 
concern about someone who might bring forward uh, an application under this language where someone says, I'm proposing to join the trail system when I'm done. And now right. we're changing the review criteria for their project. But in fact, in the other, when they were done, they might not, they, I don't know if they'd be obligated to um, actually apply or they might not be willing or able financially, for instance, to build to the level that would win acceptance into the trail system. Uh, you know, I could imagine engineered culverts are way more pricey than something uh, a group of volunteers might put in on the weekend, that kind of thing. Yes, uh, that's a lot there. I'm trying to digest and um, give you a straight answer that's concise. You know, there, there are, we have encountered this with, uh, and as, as Ellen, the Ledge Council has indicated, um, you know, perhaps she's referencing there's there's a there's a network of trails now um you kind of get this chicken and egg kind of situation develops where uh they ask us we'd like to be in the trail system we say well part of that is the permits uh, if they know they have if they've triggered act 250 then they need to get their act 250 but if they don't know or it isn't isn't um, jurisdictional we would say then you're good to go as long as you're open uh and and not commercial um, if there's a jurisdictional opinion then that, that would question that, that would put it on hold, I suppose, because that would suggest they, they need to have the permit. Um, and, but we've not, we have seen, you know, particularly with the proliferation and expansion of uh, world-class mountain biking in our state, there have been in the last 10 years, a number of them added to the system that have not triggered Act 250. They, similarly, they come with a proposal, they ask, does this meet it? And we meet the criteria, you're in. Um, and I think that's what we're struggling with is what if Act 250 applies? That's more of the question. I, I, I'm trying to give you some color around the, the, the issues as we've experienced them. Um, and I'll Great. Okay. So I appreciate it. I mean, there, we're talking about hypoth hypotheticals, which always get a little dicey. Um, <laughs> that's right. uh, Mr. Coleman, you had, uh, you had off offered some language or thoughts on this provision before. Can you speak to it again this morning? Yes, I'm happy to. Thank you. Um, first, uh, just one, in terms of this chicken or egg piece, really the, 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 the end entity that's going to have the, the, the challenge in front of them in front of them is going to be the organization that's proposing a trail. If they come in and say, we're going to propose a trail and it's going to be part of the VTS. And for some reason, Vermont trails and greenways council and commissioner Snyder don't think it's eligible, then that's their problem. <laughs> They're the ones that, that maybe are now going to have to go back and seek a permit that they didn't, they didn't get. So I, I don't see, uh, I, I don't see how someone's truly going to game the system, but to, to allay, the, that those concerns, uh, Matt Chapman and I've had some language that may put sort of an end point to this, that, um, basically you would say, um, uh, the subdivision shall be the exclusive means for determining jurisdiction over a recreational trail. That is, it is a Vermont trail systems trail. And then here's the new language or has enrolled a Vermont trail systems trail within three months of the completion of the construction. So it puts a finite backstop on somebody to get into the program within a certain amount of time after that trail is completed um, and not have just sort of this infinite amount of, uh, of, of flexibility. We are really trying to deal with the practical situation that historically most trails have, have applied after they've built, but it would seem that it would be actually very practical for people to want to apply to be recognized as part of the Vermont Trail Systems Trail uh, before they spend the time, energy, and money to to develop that trail system. So that's that's all we were trying to do is recognize that most people want to get into something before they actually expend the time and money. But I can, Ellen has that language. We thought it put a a hard stop, a cap on when somebody had to fulfill that obligation to be in or out and not have uh, not have sort of this revolving uh, chicken and egg potential um, issue that I think we're all struggling with a little bit. 
Okay. And what's the consequence of failing to meet that obligation? They say in good faith that they want to be in, but they don't develop in such a manner that they well, really, really the, the, the only benefit here to being part of the Vermont trail system is, is that you're recognized for a public purpose and you have a 10 acre threshold. That's, that's right. really all we're talking about here. So if somebody has built, um, something, uh, you know, it really depends on what, if you're in a one acre town and you've built five acres of trail and you're not part of the Vermont trail system, then you may have triggered, right. You may have triggered act 250. I mean, that's, that, that's the consequences. If you don't build your trail and build it to the standard to get to, to get in, then you may have to go back and get review of that uh, review of that project. That's the, that's really the only thing we're talking about here is, is that 10 acre, is that 10 acre threshold. Okay, so the fact that someone would develop during this 18 month period uh, under these set of criteria is laid out in the bill now. Um, yep. Doesn't and that it's, it's a right to continue to operate that way? Can you say that again? Well, I'm just wondering if after the fact, someone could say you, you, um, you didn't get into the trail system, so you're not demonstrating a public good. So therefore, Act 250 under ordinary circumstances would have been triggered. Does the state have recourse to say uh, that, yes, in fact, you will have to meet Act 250 um, if you want to operate? or by letting someone proceed yeah, have to go and, yeah, under this language. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't think want the, more, the state to lose its likely. ability to regulate. No, this, the, state, the state wouldn't. If somebody needs a permit, they can be required to go back and get it. I think the more likely scenario is Commissioner Snyder would say, these are the deficiencies. Go, go uh, get either the necessary permit or fix whatever the deficiencies are that they've uh, recognized and have the trail was constructed, fix those, and then you can be admitted. I mean, there's That's really, right. there's really not a lot. There's no advantage for somebody to go spend the time, money, and resources to, to, uh, build like this and try to get admitted, uh, and then say, nah, never mind. We don't want to be part of the system. That's just, I, I don't quite understand that. I don't really don't think any of the, any of the people that are building trails that want to, that want to be in part of the Vermont trail system are coming to this with that, uh, uh, with that intent or, 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 or mentality. Okay. That's just, I think we're talking about a hypothetical also in a very short amount of time we're talking about here. Um, so let's, uh, if you could send that language to Ms. Schakowsky, please, then yeah, we'll. I think Ellen has it from an email from Matt, Matt Chapman yesterday. Okay, so then I think um, let's keep going through this section because I know there's more to come. And at this point, we don't have to dot the I's and cross the T's. We'll, let's just see what we have so we can finish the walkthrough of all 24 pages. Sure, so I restructured um, the next section in this uh, and added some consistent terms. So for this subdivision involved land includes land that is physically altered, including any ground disturbance and clearing that it will occur. Infrastructure that is incidental to the operation of the trails, including restrooms, parking areas, shelters, picnic areas, kiosks, and interpreted and directional signage. And so this, as we've just discussed, really is sort of the heart of it. We're talking about what is considered involved land, um, and that is what's used to trigger Act 250 jurisdiction. So what is physically altered is, is, included, in, is included in involved land, and then the incidental uh, uh, structures. Okay. Uh, but for purposes of the subdivision involved land does not include land where no ground will be disturbed or cleared or any Vermont trail system trail constructed before July 1, 2020. So um, then there's this uh, further language around rec recreational trails. Subdivision involved land does not include land where no ground N or cleared or any Vermont trail system trail constructed before 
Okay. When jurisdiction over a trail has been established pursuant to subdivision A of this subdivision, jurisdiction shall extend only to the recreational trail and infrastructure that is incidental to the operation of the trail. Jurisdiction shall not extend to the remainder of the parcel or parcels where the recreational trail is located unless otherwise determined to be jurisdictional pursuant to another provision of this chapter. So this, this, this language is 73. 71, yes. 71. Yep. being moved into statute. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And then um, this language uh, is sort of the inverse of that the Rule 71. Um, development that includes a, rec a Vermont trail system trail shall include that trail for determining the amount of involved land but shall not consider the construction of improvements for the trail as part of the review of the permit application for the development. Okay. So again, this is, um, this is still a very odd provision. I worked on trying to make it more clear, um, but it is about, um, the trail is part of the involved land um, calculation, but it is not part of a permit application for a develop for development that isn't a trail. Okay, so are what we getting at that? Um, I don't know if you if you decided to develop. Uh, I think who, who brought up the provision? Someone's going to develop a brewery and a parking lot next to their trail system, and it's going to be bike biking and brewery. Uh, and this is distinguishing the two. I, uh, sorry, Mr. Coleman, I saw your hand go up. Yeah, I think we can't think when talking about this, we maybe came up with an example that's maybe more likely. It's not as exciting as the brewery example, but somebody's building a, a subdivision with a number of uh, a number of houses, and as part of that project they are going to build recreational trails for um, uh, as, you know, as, as part of, to include as part of that uh, part of that project. And let's say they're in a 10 acre town and the, the, the houses in the, that development is basically, you know, nine acres or something. And the development of those trails would put them over, you know, over into a 10 acre, th you know, basically threshold. That's, that's the issue I think that, and this was mostly from the, the forest partnership wanted to make sure that somebody couldn't um, uh, that we weren't going to take something that would normally be considered development other than a trail, some, some, something that was typically considered development or act 250 and have it not be um, uh, not be captured because it was associated with the trail. So that's, that's what we're trying to, that's really what we're trying to, to get at here is if your project is a, sort of a normal act 250 development and it includes a trail component to it. It's all one project that you, you, you count all of that disturbance for purposes of jurisdiction. That's, that's all this is trying to get at. Okay. Was this in a, I'm just trying to remember, is this new, in a prior this section? Ellen just moved, we just reordered this and Ellen made it uh, read more clearly than it probably did before. Okay. Thank you. So let's keep marching on if there are not any committee questions on it. All right, so now we're in section 6081 of Act 250, which is the exemption section. So no permit or permit amendment shall be required for the construction of improvements on a tract of land that would provide access across a trail, provided that the access is not related to the use of the permitted recreational trail. and would not establish jurisdiction under this chapter on its own. Um, this is the example of um, a landowner creating a driveway or something that would cross a trail and then uh, this new language in Z is the um, so-called moratorium language. So until January 1, 2022, no permit is required for a Vermont trail system trail recognized pursuant to chapter 20 of this title if the trail was in existence prior to July 1, 2020. Well, let's keep going. 
Uh, so that's what that's basically what's what's been built is built, right? Yeah. Uh, um, okay, so let me just ask: Are are there there are this is the so-called moratorium on JOs. Is that, I know people don't like that language. It's sort of inflammatory in some circles, but is that basically what we're saying? Yes. Yes, for a window of time, um, trails built before July 1, 2020 do not need a permit. Right, but once we get to July- To exist, to exist or to be altered? Uh, to mm -hmm. exist. Um, and alterations? Yeah. Uh, alterations are not addressed under this. So we got a uh, an unaddressed 18 month period where what you have is okay and what you add to it is not yet addressed. So if you have a permit already and you're going to make alterations to your your trail it will go through the amendment process and that's not what this language does not apply to that so if you are grandfathered on the first of july what may you do additionally after the first of july during the 18 months period i mean everything from you know, hauling fill and building retaining walls or blasting rock? What, what, is, what is not permitted during the 18 months and what is permitted? So this is only applying to things that are already in existence. So it will not apply to things added after July 1, 2020. A permit other than may be required. Maintenance, other than routine maintenance, but there won't be any. Correct. No no uh i mean that's clear routine maintenance um you, no, yes. we, routine maintenance is not addressed in this this is not going to apply to that um but okay. to senator mcdonald's point is there any kind of trigger where someone might say this amount of maintenance is actually you know we might call it de further development right so that's not what this is talking about. Okay. Does this get talked about somewhere else? It's, I don't think that's an issue at all. We're not trying to change trail maintenance procedures. Right. I'm, that's understood. I'm not okay. worried about trail maintenance procedures. I'm worried about, <laughs> we have 18 months to build some retaining walls, blast some rock, build a causeway, do, do things to, because we, when this thing, at the end of 18 months, we want to switch from this use to uh, you know, ATVs or motorcycles or, or whatever. Is there any restriction during those 18 months on new construction of trails? So, Parking lot, uh, snack bars. They will, if they trigger Act 250 during that time, under this new language, then yes, they will need to get an Act 250 permit during that time. This is saying that things that are currently in existence or will be built in the next two weeks, and then we stop, those will not need a permit. So if the trail was built illegally, but exists, it'll be legal for this period of time, even if it wasn't. No, no, these are for Vermont trail system trails that are in existence and currently recognized by the state. That's, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about illegal trails. We're not talking about new trails. We're talking about Vermont trail system trails that have been recognized as of July, that, that are in existence as of July 1st, 2021. That's, it's a very narrow subset so that people are not having to respond to jurisdictional opinions while they're trying to make a transition to a new program. That's all this is doing. Thank you, Warren. Very helpful. You're welcome. And timely. <laughs> Thank you. 
So let's keep cruising, please. So uh, the report uh, of the recommendations, um, we changed the language slightly on or before December 15th, 2020. ANR shall report back to the legislature with recommendations for best management practices driven program for the Vermont Trail System Trails that is administered by the Agency of Natural Resources. The report shall include recommendations for revisions to the Vermont Trail System Trail chapter, including revisions to mapping legislative authority to administer the program and potential funding sources and staffing needs. Uh, natural Resources shall consult with stakeholders on the proposed program, including the Trail Alliance, Forest Partnership, and uh, VTrans. Thank you. So, committee, are most are people set with what we have? I, I still have a bit of a question, but I think I don't want to bog us down entirely um, sorting through a, a few details on it. No, I, I'm yeah, I'm okay. I mean, we're on the floor in 25 minutes, so yes, I think we've got to not try to get bogged down too much. Yep. So let's take a look at what remains. Forest blocks. So um, I think based on the conversations that we had um, recently, I think that this committee was leaning towards the language that is in 926 as opposed to 233, um, which amends criterion eight and has an undue adverse impact standard that references avoid, minimize, mitigate. So the language is here. So will not result in an undue adverse impact on forest blocks, connecting activity or connecting, connecting habitat or rare and irreplaceable natural areas. If a project as proposed would result in an ad, undue adverse impact, a permit may only be granted if effects are avoided, minimized or mitigated in accordance with rules adopted by the board. And then there is this rulemaking provision that I added. And so um, make the pitch for what or what I what we're about to go through, and that was the, the avoid minimize impact uh, discussion that we've had in two thirty three and one sixty five. Um, was being replaced by the no adverse. Uh, no adverse impacts. And so uh, I would say the goals of the committee repeatedly have been avoid, minimize, mitigate. And so um, as we ask for rulemaking, let's be explicit that that's our goal um, in the rulemaking so that we get rules back that uh, aim to achieve that. So that's all. So yeah, so the language I added um, includes rules adopted shall include how forest blocks and connecting habitat are further defined, including their size, location, and function, which may include information that will be available to the public to determine where forest blocks and connecting habitat are located, or advisory, or advisory mapping resources, how they will be available, how they will be used, and how they will be updated standards establishing how fragmentation of forest blocks or connective connecting habitat is avoided or minimized, which may include steps to promote proactive site design of buildings, roadways and driveways, utility location and location relative to existing features such as roads, tree lines and fence lines. Criteria to identify when a forest block or connecting habitat is eligible for mitigation standards for how impacts of forest blocks or connecting habitat may be mitigated, including appropriate ratios for compensation, appropriate forms of compensation, such as conservation easements, fee interests in lands, and other forms of compensation, and appropriate uses of on-site and off-site mitigation. Uh, having a working group, and then uh, this has pro uh, final proposed rules um, January 1, 20, uh, September 1, 2021. So uh, a little over a year. 
Okay. And that's the language from 926, just so you know, the, the rulemaking language. All right, and then the road rule is in here. Um, resource mappings, which was at, was part of both 233 and um, 926. So it does require that ANR's maps do include the forest blocks. Um, and then the last, the very last thing is the uh, language related to the forest products industry, the um, permit conditions for the forest products industry and the um, change in the calculation for primary ag soil mitigation for forest products industry. Okay. And I think we have no changes since the last version we went through in committee the other day, correct? Correct. Right. Okay, great. And does that bring us to the end of this? Yes. Okay, yes. great. So thank you. I know people are going to have more thoughts and we'll, you know, I'll ask people to read this comment um, and um, uh, the goal will be to have a more formal draft for Monday's meeting that will be in votable shape. Um, Ellen, would you mind just emailing that, that draft to us? Sure, it's on the website, but I can send it. Do you mind emailing it to me? Sure. Would that be okay? Thanks. Appreciate the it. The one we just looked at? Yeah. Yeah. Would you do the same to the yeah, rest of me, please? Thank you. The rest of us. We'll send it to uh, the... Um, yeah, I can send it to everybody. Or, or Jude. Yeah. Thank you, Jude. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. So now we are going to um, throw that discussion to park for a moment and uh, turn to um, Evan Meenan uh, sent a, well, a, me a memo was shared by the Natural Resources Board. Mr. Neen is speaking on behalf of the NRB. Um, the concern, as I said, is a little bit, I think, outside our jurisdiction. We don't get into the definitions of affordable, et cetera, but um, we, are, we are on the way to preparing a draft for the floor. So I'd like to just pause for 10 minutes and hear uh, about these definitions and make sure that all parties have sorted out the definitions so we don't end up constructing something with unintended consequences in the end. So Mr. Meenan, if you could speak to the committee about, uh, you know, sort of a high level walkthrough of your memo and flag the issues that you were seeing as, I, I guess I'd call them a concern. Absolutely, and thank you for the opportunity to testify for the record. And I'm the Associate General of the Natural Resources Board. And the purpose of my testimony today is, as mentioned, to give a very high overview of a May 19th, uh, 2020 memo from Diane Snelling, the board chair of the Central Finance Committee. That memo deals exclusively with Section 5 of Draft 9.1. Yeah, um, I don't know if I, I'm having trouble hearing you, Mr. Meenan. I don't know if others are. Um, I'm wondering if suffering. I can't hear him. Yeah. Okay. I wonder perhaps if you went to um, sound only. Sometimes that helps people if we just get, they drop out the video load on the channel. <laughs> we hear their voice better than we can watch the video. Let's give it a try and see if that works. All right. That sounds better already to me. So far, so good. Fantastic. That, that might mean I put on my coat and tie for nothing, but that's, that's okay. <laughs> you made a good first impression, so that's it. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So I want to I first clarify that two points about the memo. The first is that the board is not taking a position on any affordable affordability thresholds outside of the context of Act 250. And S-237, uh, a majority of it does, does not deal with the concerns raised uh, in the memo. So we're not taking a position on what affordability thresholds should be used in, for example, federal and state housing finance programs. 
The second caveat is that the NRB is also not actually taking a position on what the appropriate affordability threshold is in the Act 250 context. Um, The NRB is an Act 250 expert. It's not really an affordable housing expert. And our primary goal was to flag a very discreet issue, which is the potential for a rise in the maximum permissible sales price of some types of owner-occupied housing. And that's an important issue because the maximum potential sales price dictates which types of housing developments benefit from the special jurisdictional trigger um, that applies to priority housing projects. The issue of priority housing projects is somewhat complicated because of the multiple different definitions that you need to consult in order to determine uh, whether it's a priority housing project and what um, criteria a project needs to meet. Um, Those multiple definitions, there's six of them, are discussed on pages two and three of the memo. Um, It's very, they're, they're very complicated, the interplay. I tried to uncomplicate them to the maximum degree possible in the memo itself. I'm happy to answer questions about those definitions, but my plan was not to try and explain them in detail right now. Instead, I was going to skip right to the problem that the board has identified. Yep, Um, thank you. So section five uh, of S237, specifically page, page 11, lines one through seven, replaces the definition of owner-occupied mixed income housing with the definition of owner-occupied affordable housing. In other words, there used to be two separate definitions of affordable housing for two different jurisdictional triggers, one for priority housing projects and one for permanently affordable housing. The proposed amendment in S-237 would take one uh, affordability threshold and apply it to both jurisdictional triggers. This has the secondary effect of increasing the maximum potential sales price of priority housing projects and the estimates of those potential increases appear on pages three and four of the memo. Um, There is an alternate proposal already on the table for addressing um, some of the issues related to priority housing. And that alternate proposal is discussed on page four of the memo. Um, That proposal is similar to the one in S-237 in two ways. The first of which is that it attempts to close what we've been calling the PHP loophole. And that loophole is the fact that the maximum potential sales price of housing is not tied to the size of the housing unit. So for example, as of just a few weeks ago, the maximum potential sales price of a unit in a priority housing project was $270,000. That was true whether it was a studio size condo, a one bedroom house, or a five bedroom house. Um, And that was creating issues because you could have the proper amount of units cost $270,000, but charge that amount all for a, you know, a studio size condo, even if studio size condos in the market were fetching for less than that money. So that is a positive step that both proposals uh, try to make. Um, The other similarity between the two proposals is that they both use a percentage of area median income as the affordability threshold. But here is the difference. The S-237 proposal wants to use 120% of area median income. Right now, that is the affordability threshold for permanently affordable housing in Act 250 but it is not the affordability threshold for priority housing projects in Act 250. The affordable housing uh, threshold for priority housing projects is much lower. And so for example, 
Um, and, and, and so for example, um, you know, under the proposal in S-237, you could have a housing development project consisting exclusively of one bedroom homes in Isle Lamont, Vermont, and you could charge approximately, and these are rough estimates, $295,000 for all of those one bedroom homes in Isle Lamont and qualify for the preferential jurisdictional trigger for Act 250 purposes. Now, the Natural Resources Board is not necessarily saying that $295,000 is affordable or unaffordable. What we are saying is that at a minimum, that is a $25,000 increase from what would currently be allowed. Um, and what the board would like to bring to the entire legislature's attention is that fact and encourage the legislature to say, as a matter of fact, is that affordable for individuals living in, for example, Isle of Lamont? Um, and as we suggested in our memo, you know, we would encourage this committee and every other committee taking up S-237 to consult with individuals who do have more of an expertise in setting housing prices, including VHFA, uh, who I know is on this call, including ACCD, and really drill down on two issues. What is affordable, actually affordable for folks, and what types of affordable housing projects should benefit from special Act 250 permitting treatment? Um, that is a very high level overview of the memo. I would be happy to answer any specific questions the senators might have about the memo, but I also want to be cognizant of the fact that you do have commitments to be on the floor very shortly. Okay. Um, Senator Perry, can you have a question? I'll say, okay. All right. Um, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Meaning. That was perfect for the size window we have to work in at the moment. So now I'd like to, and uh, I know that we have a number of people from the uh, housing community on the call. And um, so I, I'm not sure who amongst um, you that would like to go first. Ms. Collins, I see your hand up. So I'm going to unmute myself. Uh, good morning. My name is Maura Collins. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. And I put my hand up because VHFA is the agency that's named in this piece of the um, statute. Uh, the, I know you were short on time, so I'm going to be as brief as Evan was. The change that House Natural approved and was vetted by the Senate uh, housing committee was needed because currently in statute, the definition of affordable housing for home ownership that's currently in statute refers to VHFA's purchase price limits that no longer exist. We've known about this for a couple of years. Y'all don't open up the Act 250 statute very often. Um, and so uh, we waited until there was an opportunity to fix this. And we've had a workaround for the last few years that I'll explain in a second. But in preparation, knowing that you were going to be looking at the Act 250 um, legislative language, VHFA partnered with the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition, and the Governor's Administration. And we all worked on a solution that we all agreed to that uses a traditional definition of affordable housing for home ownership. Because in the housing world, uh, we gauge incomes, not by dollars and cents like normal people, but we do it based on a percent of area median income, which we call AMI. And we typically see that rental programs go to 80% of the area median income, AMI. And for affordable home ownership, it's typical to set that limit at 120% of AMI. Uh, there are government programs that target households below 120 AMI, but those are usually funding programs, and meaning that there's government money to subsidize the housing and make it affordable under 120% AMI. 
uh, obviously the Priority Housing Project Act 250 exemption is not cash, it's not funding, it's regulatory relief, um, but it doesn't come with direct dollars to reduce the cost of housing directly and, and get that um, purchase price down. So I mentioned that we've had a workaround. The workaround is that since there's no um, programmatic uh, new construction targeted area purchase price limit established by VHFA, since that doesn't exist anymore, uh, VHFA created a website and said, hey, communities and builders and everyone else, this is that limit. Uh, but I want you to know that there's no uh, rules on VHFA about how we get to that number. We, we, it's a statewide number. It's not um, county based. So people in Chittenden County, housing in Chittenden County or Isle Lamont, like the example used, it all uses one. It doesn't differentiate by bedroom size. As Evan pointed out, that's problematic. There, there's a lot of problems in why this fix in S-237 was necessary. And the reasons that the all the affordable housing groups agreed on um, the language that we did that's in S-237 is um, that it makes sense for a lot of reasons. And I, I've talked with Evan a bunch and we've um, I've looked at what VNRB has proposed and um, they have been using 85% of AMI and that's not calculated by any of us. That's not a number we work with. Um, so it is virtually impossible for a developer to build new newly constructed house and come in below 85% um, AMI. So if you essentially want the priority housing project to not ever work, then you could do that definition. It, it won't work. Um, and um, there's been talk about extending the affordability requirements to 15 years. Uh, for homeownership, which would um, require probably um, liens and you'd need to set up a state agency, name a state agency that would have to um, create um, this program and then administer it and uh, enforce it and be looking when there's closings to make sure that um, that that 15, are we within the 15 years or not? You're going to need uh, funding, frankly, for a state agency to do this work because um, this doesn't exist outside of, there are government agencies like VHCB and VHFA and others who um, do administer long um, homeownership programs with these kind of longevity um, terms, but it's because we're administering dollars, funding, not just regulatory. So last thing I want to say is that it's, oh. it, did you have a question? I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say, so we're not proposing in this committee a change to this language. It was just simply that a question was put on the table for us. And I wanted to make sure that we weren't sort of blindly passing along uh, a bill without do, uh, doing our due diligence and to say, have these definitions been reconciled by interested parties and do all the interested parties support the language as it currently exists in 237? I will say the interested parties I named, meaning, um, well, Jen's on screen, VHCB, um, the Affordable Housing Coalition, and uh, DHCD in, for the governor's office um, does support this. And the last thing I was going to say is that it is true that the maximum sales price that Evan pointed out has happened. So when we first published that workaround number, it was at $300,000 statewide. Now it's $350,000. But I just want to say that is not because the mission-driven affordable housing agencies are trying to drive up the cost of housing or trying to um, do this. That's a function of the increased housing costs that we see in the state and how much it costs to build new construction over the last several years. Okay. So, um, Okay, we're gonna have to pause there because we're on the floor in just five minutes. Um, 
Ms. Holler, if you want to sort of weigh in and just say <laughs> whether you're, uh, I see you nodding, but we're not going to, that's gonna, not really going to be recorded. Sure. So if you could just. Good morning. Sort of Jen Holler with the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. I concur with everything Maura said and can confirm that all of us in the housing, affordable housing community, along with the administration and others, feel like um, the language that's in 237 right now is necessary and it works. Okay. Great. Um, do I, I don't, any questions from the committee on this part of the, the bill? All right. So thank you everyone, um, for hanging in there and thanks for being brief, but we covered what we needed to check in on. Um, Mr. Nelson, you know, my apology that when we got to, uh, the forest frag provisions, we had to change channels and go to housing. Um, I will follow up with you offline and would like to reschedule your testimony to Monday morning if you are available. Sure, uh, thank you, Senator okay. Bray, I appreciate right. that. So with that, we have... I didn't know if you could hear me, sorry. <laughs> so I'll follow up with you and we'll um, reschedule. And again, I'm, I'm sorry that we were unable to hear from you this morning. Sure, um, okay. That that sounds great. Thank you to everyone. Um, uh, I'll, I'll anticipate if you see issues of interest in the draft that we walked through today that I would ask people to weigh in. Um, if you have concerns, I would ask that you not just weigh in to say I have a concern, but to propose a specific change to language you see so that we know exactly what you mean if you were the one writing that section. Um, and with that, um, we are adjourned. See my colleagues on the floor in three minutes. Thanks so much, everyone.